A very good afternoon, everyone. This is Neha Makol, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to Bridge to India's webinar on CNI consumers aiming for 100% renewable power. Coffee renewable market is going through a fundamental shift, and many consumers are pledging to achieve net zero and charting out their roadmap to increase renewable penetration. And in this backdrop, we have organized this webinar today to discuss the potential opportunities and challenges for corporate consumers who are aiming to shift to 100% RE. And we've got very eminent panel today to deliberate on this topic. And it is my privilege to introduce them to you. We have with us Mr. Animesh Jain, Director and Finance Head from CIPLA. Mr. Animesh Sharma, Head of Business Development in Hero Future Energies. Mr. Deeraj Malani, Chief Growth Officer at Uriano Clean Energy. We have uh, Mr. Sai Charan, Technical Director at Jinko Solar. I welcome you all today to this session and thank you so much for taking out time and joining us. Also, we would like to thank our sponsor, Hero Future Energies, for supporting our, this webinar. We'll start with a brief presentation on CNI sustainability landscape by Mr. Animesh Sharma from Hero and followed by the panel discussion, which will be moderated by my colleague, Ms. Sangeeta Suresh. Associate Director, uh, Market Intelligence from Bridge to India. So today's webinar will be an hour and 30 minutes long, and we will be taking questions towards the end. So do send us your questions uh, in the chat box located at the bottom right corner of your uh, webinar panel. And one last thing before we start, I would like to tell you about our flagship product, RE Navigator. It is a market intelligence tool which is accessible 24-7 and it covers all the developments in the market including policies, tenders, projects, key players. To know more, please visit uh, indiarinavigator.com and that is all from me. So I will hand it over to Mr. Animesh. Over to you, sir. Thank you. The floor is yours, Animesh. You can take over. Yeah, she just was hi, hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Neha. Thanks, Sangeeta, and thanks, Bridge to India, for organizing this seminar. It's um, it's quite a important and vital subject to touch base upon in the present context of things. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Animesh. I am working with Hero Future Energies, and I lead uh, their business development initiatives uh, across all renewable energy markets and technologies in India. So uh, today we are just going to touch base quickly upon the road to RE100 and how it's important from the point of view of CNI sector, right? Uh, it's a very important sector. Uh, this is going to be the presentation flow. I'm going to quickly touch base upon who Hero is, um, who we are as Hero Future Energies. I'm going to put things about the entire energy sector from the CNI perspective. Uh, we're going to also touch base upon what are the RE options available to us today from the technology side of things. Uh, then we'll take a deeper dive onto the roadmap that we that I possibly see towards 100% RE. Uh, last but not the least, we'll be looking at hurdles and enablers before we move in about how Hero Future Energies is positioned to help our CNI customers make that transition to 100% uh, RE. Audible? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are part of the we are Hero Group. Uh, it's it's a seven billion dollar plus group with interests across automotive, manufacturing, um, financing, electronics, and renewable energy. Um, you know, we are one of the world's largest two wheeler manufacturers uh, through Hero Motor Corp. We have our you know own uh, non banking financial corporations with Hero Fin Corp. Uh, in the consumer electronics division, we've got Hero Electronics. In education, we've got Hero Wired. Uh, auto ancillaries have Rockman uh, Industries, where we make die casting uh, alloy wheels for two wheelers as well as four wheelers today. And uh, Hero Future Energies, that's the company that I represent, uh, is the renewable energy arm of our group. So that's our brandscape. Uh, Next. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so uh, introducing Hero Future Energies, uh, as I said, we are the RE arm of. Uh, the Hero Group, and uh, we were established in 2012. Uh, predominantly started our journey as a wind and solar independent power producer. Uh, in the initial years, we've you know kind of set up an asset base of uh, 1.6 gigawatts of operational uh, wind and solar power projects. 
uh, using these projects to supply uh, power majorly to uh, ISCOMs and you know, you know PSUs like SECI and NTPC. Um, we had headquartered in London uh, with corporate offices across uh, Delhi and Singapore. Our investors include the uh, National Finance Corporation and uh, Mazda, which is a sovereign RE fund of the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. Um, in the CNI segment, uh, we've, we've, we've become very active in the past four years. Uh, we have around 150 megawatts of operational uh, wind and solar uh, open access assets uh, from which we are you know, servicing our CNI customer base in Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. Uh, we are doing this through both group captive as well as third party open access sales. Uh, we are also quite active in the rooftop space. Uh, today we've got around 80 megawatts of installed assets across different uh, business models. So that's a little bit about what Hero Future Energy's journey has been like. Uh, so now uh, taking on to this most important part is the next slide which is putting the energy usage, usage of uh, the CNI, you know, yeah, thanks. So the energy usage, uh, you know, from the CNI perspective. So whenever we say energy in the CNI sector, I mean, somehow it's always about power and electricity, right? But that's not the entirety of things. Uh, or you have more important avenues to touch base upon, uh, which I won't say remain neglected, but they don't get the same attention that, you know, power and electricity has been. So uh, let's start with electricity and power and give it the importance that it has been enjoying all this while. Electricity and power is you being utilized by the industry for basically running the show, right? So you're running everything from production lines to illuminating your factories and offices. You're running your lifts and elevators, um, burning arc furnaces, using it in hoisting cranes and HVAC systems. If you look at the predominant sources that you know you're using this power from, almost 90% of it is coming from the grid then, you know, maybe captive power plants, which are either fired by coal uh, or gas and combined heat and power plants. And less than 10% has, uh, you know, seen solar and wind penetration today. So, you know, that's the opportunity size that, that, that the CNI market shows alone in electricity and power. And uh, the second is the process heat bit, right? So an interesting and fun fact is that process heat accounts for almost two thirds of, of uh, the industrial energy requirement. And, uh, you know, what are we doing for it today? You're using it for steam and hot water in your process heating. It could be chemical processing, sterilization, distillation, industrial ovens. I mean, the list just goes on and on, right? What are the sources you're using today? You're either using boilers, which are fired by fuel oil or by coal or by gas. And when you come to look at what's the RE penetration in process heat, I mean, I'd be very optimistic in saying it's less than 5%. Probably it's less than 2%. So that's another opportunity that, that is there to capture, right? And third and most importantly is, you know, transport. So whatever produce that the industry is making, you know, it needs to reach the end consumer. And today, the only, you know, modes of transport are, Road, rail, marine shipping, and air freight. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, rail to a large extent is, you know, uh, having electrical propulsion, but where is that? Where is that energy coming from? So, railways alone in the CNI sector probably consume almost 20% of the electricity. So, you know, that needs to come from renewable sources, et cetera. So, I would peg this number at less than 1% of our penetration today. So collectively, if you see the CNI sector is guzzling more than 60% of India's total energy. And, uh, you know, if we offset this entire quantum to renewable sources, uh, you know, that's the elephant in the room that we need to address. So coming to RE options that are available today in terms of technology terms, electricity, obviously, we've got on-site solar. Uh, it could be rooftop, it could be ground mount, it could be floating, it could be carports. I mean, the best part about solar PV is that, you know, any place that the sun shines, you can install it and, you know, kind of use it to generate power. So. In my opinion, on-site solar makes a lot of sense. It cuts away your distribution and transmission losses. You can literally use what you're producing with minimal losses in the system. Uh, on-site wind, uh, you know, vertical axis wind turbines, uh, we don't see many of them, but uh, I think that's an idea uh, that should definitely see a light of day right now. Uh, but, but collectively these, you know, are limited by space constraints, uh, space constraints on your roof or your premises. So, 
uh, probably will be able to offset maybe 10, maybe 15% of your total energy requirement. So that's where large offsite plants come into picture. So today, a lot of corporate procurement is, uh, renewable procurement is happening from offsite solar and wind or offsite hybrids, right? Maybe solar and wind standalone could offset maybe 25 to 30% of your total uh, energy requirement in the factory. A hybrid could take it as high as to probably 80% or even, you know, RTC using storage. You've got hydropower, you've got biomass, biogas, you've got fuel cells, and today, I mean, the buzzword is hydrogen. So, again, that's that's an idea worth exploring today. Uh, coming to heat, uh, you know, you can use solar water heaters uh, for low-grade heating, which is less than 250 degrees. You can use your rooftops uh, to generate this heat. Uh, there is concentrating solar thermal technologies available to uh, you know develop process steam or process you know hot water which is less than 700 degrees um, various technologies are there in the market today uh, parabolic troughs parabolic dishes panel lenses you know you name it there are so many startups doing so you know a lot of interesting work uh, in the cst space uh, biomass and biogas again it's an on-site generation for heat for yourselves a waste heat recovery it could be from a boiler it could be from your um, you know air conditioning vents uh, use that capture it you know that's something that will definitely help to whatever minuscule level it can you've got ground source heat pumps which is making sense today uh, i was reading a report where the heat pump market is expected to be almost 3.8 billion dollars by the year 2027 so that's an opportunity that needs to be captured and once again the hydrogen uh, you know versatile hydrogen comes into play where you can use hydrogen to heat and um, also geothermal. Coming on to transport, your options are not manifold, but they're interesting options. We are seeing a lot of activity happening in the EV space. So battery operated EVs definitely are a, is an idea whose time has come today. Uh, we are already seeing uh, aggregators like Big Basket or you know, maybe Swiggy, which is using uh, EV two wheelers to deliver our goods to our houses. Um, Moving ahead, you'll definitely see, you know, Toyotas and the other uh, technology leaders getting in fuel cell vehicles, you know, which will help us probably run trucks for uh, long distance uh, deliveries. And uh, recent government mandates of getting and featuring in biofuels with ethanol blending. Uh, these are these are ideas that are available today and they should definitely be looked upon with all seriousness. So we move. Okay, so uh, this, this in my mind is probably a roadmap that we have to renewals. I've broken it into three sections, uh, broken in about ideas that are making immediate sense, right? So uh, a penny saved is a penny earned. So let's start by improving the energy efficiency measures in our factories uh, and commercial establishments. Right? Uh, if you do an energy monitoring, you'll see there are a lot of vampire loads that are not useful to you and they are just hogging electricity and you know costing you money and uh, bringing their own level of inefficiencies. Uh, once again, uh, I'll touch base on maximizing on-site energy generation. It could be through solar PV, vertical wind access, solar heating, heat pumps, whatever it is. Whatever you can do on your premise is, is probably the best utilization of that premise in terms of energy. Uh, you have off-site uh, solar, wind, hydro, open access, captive, group captive, bilateral. There are various modes. Um, during the panel discussion, we'll touch upon the you know, vagaries of each of them. Um, you've got the power exchanges active through which you can kind of at least go for your last mile or peak power requirements, which you cannot offset through uh, delivery contracts. You can go on to GTAM, GDAM, sorry, not delivery contracts, but you can go to GTAM, GDAM uh, to fulfill those requirements. Then there are green attributes, in which you know you can kind of purchase these green attributes today for uh, power that you are not able to procure, but you still have internal mandates of uh, reaching that 100% RE. And uh, pumped hydro is also something that is making sense today, so that also kind of should be taken uh, into consideration. Ideas which will make sense probably over the next couple of years is electrical battery storage might make a lot of sense in terms of commercial viability. So you'll start seeing uh, of lithium ion make its uh, entry in a commercially viable manner into the storage side of things. You'll have flow batteries like Redox. You'll have fuel cells, uh, which will be commercial viable. There are a lot of work going on in fuel cell research, and now they are commercially deployed in many countries. So India should not lag. Uh, thermal batteries for storing heat and using it at later uh, stages through molten salts. Uh, virtual PPAs, as I was mentioning earlier, so uh, 
not all delivery based contracts will help you reach the nari 100 so you will require uh, some sort of uh, an innovative instrument to you know kind of bring that last 20 or 10 percent or five percent and that's where virtual pps have that opportunity i think they have the opportunity to spur the entire uh, you know open access market and probably aims towards that 450 gigawatt target government has kept by 2030. Uh, there are discoms which are coming up with green tariffs. I think Maharashtra has come up with something in 2020. Albeit they'll be probably a little higher than your conventional tariffs that you can afford through developers like us. But uh, they will, you know, kind of uh, get away with a lot of baggies that the discom brings in uh, by itself. So India has got a shoreline of I think so around seven and a half thousand kilometers. So uh, offshore wind will start seeing light of day in the next couple of years. That's something that. Uh, you know, you'll start seeing very high CUF uh, wind plants coming up. That's something that the CNI sector can look at very interestingly. A geothermal heat, uh, vapor absorption machines and chillers for cooling applications. And large scale green hydrogen is start, you know, it's going to start making a lot of sense. And um, by 2030 is when, you know, we'll start seeing hydrogen making, you know, the local hydrogen economy starting to make sense you'll start seeing a lot of distributed green hydrogen through uh, localized electrolyzers installed within cni uh, premises we start using hydrogen to power through fuel cells uh, we will start seeing hydrogen mobility across road rail shipping and aviation on-site waste to energy is something that will you know probably be very economical and more efficient than what it is today and as i was mentioning seven and a half thousand kilometers of uh, shoreline uh, I'm just waiting for the day when tidal and wave energy starts making commercial sense. So once once a combination of all these uh, sees light of day is probably when uh, you know companies like uh, Cipla and other companies can actually just completely sign themselves off from any carbon emissions in total. So this is this is quite an important slide. And also, what are the present day hurdles that we have, and what are the enablers that the government has either already put in or can put in? to help us achieve this target so hurdles number one is policy uncertainty right um, I, I think this is something that all developers off takers manufacturers everyone's been crying out loud uh, policy it's it's the single biggest bane in the industry right now access to low cost capital uh, you know because we want to serve you we want to serve the cni sector offset their energy requirements towards green energy but obviously i mean you know you're looking at a triple bottom line so uh, it needs to be done in a very cost-effective manner. So access to low, co low cost capital. Poor health of discoms is another real big problem. I think that, that that's where all these problems spur out of, right? So uh, they don't have money. Uh, we are trying to cherry pick customers, you know, who are who are basically paying them a lot of money. Um, they don't want to let them go away. So that's how these CSS and AS and some random charges, are, you know, they keep on coming. And the problem is there's a there's a serious lack of transmission capacity in the country. If we don't build that, we are truly not one nation, one grid. And uh, we also have a high dependence on imported technology today. You know, I mean, for all our technology, be it from solar modules to batteries to whatever, I mean, we are looking towards the east. That sort of threatens our energy security ourselves. The uh, price uncertainty and barriers to trade. I mean. Uh, as developers and as off takers, you would want a fair degree of price certain certainty, especially uh, in the solar scheme of things with regards to modules. They constitute almost seventy percent of total project cost. And if you don't have, uh, you know, firm pricing over a period, because projects typically are long gestation projects. Projects will take at least six to eight months to develop, and prices today are changing by the fortnight. So price uncertainty is definitely a hurdle that we need to come up, uh, you know, kind of cross. But um, there's always a positive side uh, to the coin. So enablers, the government is doing and taking quite robust steps in terms of uh, providing a firm policy framework. So GNA is something that, you know, if enforced, uh, it kind of really helps, uh, you know, at least certain things to a, to a larger uh, extent. Multi-year tariffs uh, from discoms also should be uh, enforced, right? So that we know over a period of say five, six, seven years, what's the kind of charges that the discoms are going to charge on the power that we are trying to sell. 100% FDI, I think, is already there, but preferential lending is something that we look forward to make our power more cost-effective or energy solutions more cost. Distribution reforms: uh, the draft is already released. 
uh, fingers are crossed to, you know uh, and hope to see uh, it soon and because that's what probably will help uh, these discounts get out of their poor health state today strengthening transmission corridors i think that's that's a no brainer if we really want to truly enjoy the entire ists gamut of offerings that a lot of developers are uh, you know kind of moving towards today boost make in india towards energy security right so uh, india is kind of doing a lot of capacity building in terms of module manufacturing etc but still needs a lot of push even now and uh, as i was saying economic tailwind so we require price certainty and maybe some tax breaks to help uh, make the entire energy transition a little more cost effective so now i'll just quickly deep dive on to how uh, hero is positioned um, in helping our um, cni customers make that energy transition right so uh, we are repositioning ourselves entirely you know i mean from a from a conventional independent power producer or a or a rooftop project developer i mean we we see the problem in its entirety you know uh, we see this gap uh which is there for customers you know they they really need a one-stop shop where you know this entire 100 percent re map can be built and you know we are trying to develop products and services across this so i've broken this down into five segments uh re solutions is something that hero is already doing as i was mentioning we've got around 1.5 uh, 1.6 gigawatts of operational assets 150 megawatts in open access we are developing another 500 megawatts as I speak uh, for uh, open access solutions across solar, wind, and hybrid uh, for the CNI sector. We do a lot of behind the meter projects and uh, we are agnostic on models. We do APC, we do CapEx, uh, we do uh, OPEX, we do deferred CapEx, and we do rooftop, ground mount, car ports, floating. So, as I was saying, anywhere that we can fit it, we will install it. In fact, we are already talking to one large cement manufacturer for you know, using um, BIPV uh, for their office buildings. So that's something that we are actually doing right now. It's very interesting work. Uh, moving on, I mean, uh, that's the future. We are going to kind of uh, start offering round the clock firm renewable supply to our customers. Uh, energy storage as a service. We recently won a tender in Kerala where we are doing this. Uh, we are doing energy storage as a service. Uh, then the last mile connectivity of you know, whatever is the remaining to that in case you know you have to purchase that so we are also involving ourselves into energy trading so we will purchase this energy through gtam and wherever possible and get that energy to you so that's something that we are going to be very active in uh, third as i was mentioning uh, it's extremely important to help the industry optimize their energy consumption so we have our own in-house uh, iot based platform where we are doing real-time energy monitoring and uh, comprehensive energy audits where we can actually find out you know which machines of yours are idling uh, they are they are not adding to production but still consuming electricity so that's something that we're doing quite actively uh, and then building on from that we move to energy efficiency measures so an entire consultative approach towards you know building the entire energy efficiency ecosystem into your factories or commercial buildings is something that we start offering uh energy saving as a service where we help you save energy and the business model depends you know i mean if you save 20 units of energy so you can pay me for two so that's that's something that is on the cards for us and uh, most importantly is moving towards sustainability solutions so producing green hydrogen because green hydrogen is it's a very versatile uh, element right so it's not only used for power and heat it's also used as feedstock in many industries so that's what we're positioning ourselves for uh, we are in plans of you know, kind of installing a large gigawatt scale uh, green hydrogen plant, which we hopefully will be using to supply to the industries like fertilizers, chemical processing, you name it. Uh, lastly, uh, we are also going to be doing a lot of REC and carbon credit, uh, you know, services for our CNI clients. And uh, together, this will help us build the entire net zero roadmap, you know, so uh, zero fossil fuels in terms of electricity, zero fossil fuels in terms of mobility, and uh, zero waste, zero liquid discharge. That's the way we are positioning ourselves, and um, we hope to kind of serve this uh, CNI sector in India and help them achieve their uh, clean energy mandates. So thanks, guys. Thanks for patiently listening to me. If you got any queries, questions, that's my email ID. Oh, it's gone. You can write to me. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Anamesh. That was very comprehensive indeed. And uh, 
I mean, I think uh, you basically have touched upon every single aspect a consumer today who is serious about the net zero target for themselves should be looking at, right? Right from power to process uh, to their downstream uh, to you know beyond their uh, beyond their premises where 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 power can be saved and where. Uh, emissions can be cut so thank you uh, for that very very comprehensive uh, uh, presentation and uh, i think i would as much as i would love to like deep dive into every single one of that enablers slide that you had like there are so many aspects of that which i would love to touch upon and deep dive we do have only an hour and 15 minutes with us today and so i think i will pick up on some of the few interesting elements that you have uh, sort of hit upon today um so uh, today's discussion we we will sort of split it into uh forward looking and immediately implementable uh, prospects for the cni market and what do i mean by that we've spoken a lot about the policy issues that plague the open access market and rooftop market and the policy uncertainty quite often in the past not just in this forum but in various forums so it's something that we do uh, know uh, you know we do know what the issues are already and it's quite well known in the industry and outside of it what we would like to focus on today is sort of like an optimistic forward looking uh, a wave uh, forward looking angle uh, that is what are the new technologies that are like on the anvil and what are the new procurement routes that are uh, there right in front of us maybe in the next six months to a couple of years down the line and how will they play a role in sort of bringing together uh, this dream of Hari 100 for a lot of consumers. So with that, I want to start with uh, our consumer on the forum today, Mr. Animesh Chen from CIPLA. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you, you. once again on a panel, on on the on one of our panel discussions. Uh, yeah, CIPLA is uh, serious about uh, uh, renewable power procurement and its sustainability goals. Um, we know that you have about uh, 6385 megawatt or sorry, 63 megawatt of solar and about 2.7 megawatt of wind in your current pro procurement portfolio and about 85 megawatt in the pipeline. That's 150 megawatt right there as a consumer. And that's a phenomenal number. So congratulations on your endeavors. Um, that I mean, this clearly shows that you are serious about what you want to do. Uh, I would like to sort of understand from you, what is your current RE penetration levels uh, based on this uh, on these numbers and what are the gaps and what are the key challenges that you are currently facing in which states where to meet these gaps so i just leave it uh, i'll start with you mr Anish. thank you thank you Sangeeta, for me having in this uh, webinar and uh, would be happy to share my experience and learning as in the uh, you know the, the capacity we have added over the last three four years so uh, you know i think you said that the uh, uh, you know, they, we are serious about it. Yes, the sustainability is a, is for something or RE roadmap is something for a serious player only. There is not, no doubt in that you, one has to be serious enough if he has to achieve the RE 100. And with that objective, I think uh, three years back, we started with the, you know, uh, uh, making a strategy, procurement strategy and looking at the alternative options. Uh, you know, and as uh, rightly covered by Animesh from Hero, is that you know i think the multiple aspect have to work a portfolio strategy has to work like you know one end the energy consumption has to come down and the other end the energy has to be you know looked at uh, electricity or something you know has to be looked at in terms of alternative uh, power procurement and uh, if i have to tell you the framework which starts is like you know uh, you know the it has to go a state by state so now cipla has got a distributed manufacturing unit across uh, six states in india with uh, units uh, 40 plus units running across the across this uh, states so uh, you know the state by state you have to go because the regulations have to be studied very deeply see that what fits to the uh, regulation and your requirement both the things has to be seen because what works for the steel industry or cement industry or what works for the IT and can be different or maybe for pharma can be entirely different. So the consumption end, the industry has to be seen, the consumption pattern has to be seen and on the uh, generation side, you have to see what are the available sources. There are all sorts sources are available in each of these states. Like, you know, while the wind and wind solar hybrids are limited in the six, seven states, 
uh, we have, but you know, the solar is available across the India. So we'll have to look at the solution, regulation, and your demand. Mm -hmm. That way, there is a strategy, which is something which uh, one has to work out. And starting with like, you know, as Animesh uh, said that, you know, start with the on-site solar rooftop and then look at what are the physical power where you can take it or open access physical powers, like in a state of Maharashtra, Karnataka, Gujarat, uh, Tamil Nadu, Uttar Pradesh. So all these states, uh, Chhattisgarh, all these states have now come up with the open access policies, which are, uh, you know, supportive of uh, CNI consumer to look at the open access sources. While there could be a difficulties or the challenges, that's a part of that's a part of this uh, industry or any industry. So, uh, so these are the open access states. You know, open access power can be taken up. And then the, the third thing, which is like you know, once you reach the uh, certain stage, then you have to start looking at uh, the non-physical source, like you know, as Anima said, virtual PPA or the uh, carbon credits or IRAC. And that's how the RE uh, the RE hundred roadmap can be there. Now, a couple of things, you know, uh, as you asked, so our current RE position over the last three years or four years, whatever we have done, the capacity additions, our RE position is around the twenty five percent. If I have to look at FY twenty one twenty two closing, and we have a uh, target to reach it two hundred percent by uh, uh, twenty twenty five, which is a quite an aggressive target. And we are giving up for the you know capacity significant capacity additions to achieve this over the next three four years. And uh, the other thing is like you know at the same time we are working on the consumption end. So you know the technology like heat pump or virtual uh, VFDs, upgrading the old chillers, bringing the intelligence uh, intelligence system. So there is a machine learning, artificial intelligence systems are there which can reduce your chiller consumptions or HU consumption to a significant degree. So both the leg has to work because uh, that's how things are there. In terms mm -hmm. of uh, the other thing which I can say is that uh, uh, this is a this is like, you know, the RE100 strategy has to be bro broken up in these steps. You can't, you have to, you know, make it a multi-year plan. So say next two years, you say RE20, then RE50, and then RE70 and the RE100. And as you move in the RE curve upward, it becomes more and more challenging. RE 30, 40 could be an easy, easy thing, you know, uh, which can be a low hanging. Then after that, it becomes a little steep. And thereafter, you know, once you start hitting RE 60, 70, then it becomes really tough. And that's where, you know, the multi prong approach in terms of uh, multiple solutions has to come in play. The other thing, what if I have to close it, is that uh, again, now what I started with. It has to be a serious game. It has to be across the organization involving the side team, corporate team, and there has to be push from the top to make this happen. Mm -hmm. That it doesn't lose the momentum or the energy, uh, uh, in, you know, in spite of whatever the hurdles or the challenges we have in electricity sector. That's something which I can share. Thank you, thank you, animation. That was your your message is very clear, and I think corporates like you are actually driving the landscape of the of the RE procurement market in India. Initially, when we started, uh, it was driven uh, by policy, you know, where there were incentives, and then that momentum, the incentive momentum, sort of picked up when the equipment prices have uh, fell. You know, module prices just went down or went downwards, and it was very very attractive. A combination of good prices and policy but now both of those things are not there however there is like firm commitment from uh, the corporate uh, consumers and that is pushing driving the market and uh, with that i want to actually ask a follow-up question based on what you said you are exploring new procurement routes now uh, novel uh, routes which are not being explored which are not actually available in the past and people are thinking about it mainly the vpp as you mentioned so where do you stand what are your what is your take on it given the current status quo that it, it is still you can't really implement it in the way it is done in the uh, in the european and the western world so what is your take on how vppas are going to be implemented in the in the indian context in within the indian regulations so uh sangeeta i think you know uh, as we have uh, next three, four years to complete our RE journey, and that's where, you know, we thought that VPPA can be a solution because there are limitations 
the state regulations uh, you know the limits the open access capacity or you know the your consumption or banking uh, consumption pattern generation pattern banking rules those are the limitations that you know even for the states like maharashtra where open access are allowed one cannot go more than say 67 or 70% in case of solar or wind solar hybrid also maybe a bit higher so there is a there is a gap coming in that respect then there are states like you know uh, like we have presence in sikkim we have presence in uh, himachal pradesh mm. and some of these places we have limitation in terms of open access the options to do is the uh, when i say open access is a intra state now the option is to do the ists but in terms of ists there are again limitations in terms of 15 minute block settlement and the capacity and your connected voltage and other things and maybe ists can work for the cement and the uh, steel industry better the large scale but company like us which has a distributed footprint mm. and a discrete manufacturing uh, in the sense that we have bad change over the load keeps varying so then there is a limitation in terms of ists so looking at these limitations if we have to go with the re hundred journey journey we have to look at the what is the non physical source which is like you know vppa which allows you to do the uh, offset now here it is important is that one two options are mainly available one can go and buy the carbon credits or irec recs from the market but that's i really don't call it as a sustainability because it's not coming up with the principle of additionality and i i call it as like you know you have money and you go and buy the recs from the market so more of a green washing not in a true sense but yes for me it's a green washing if you have to be in the sustainability game then it has to be a long term and serious commitment and that's where you know vppa can you know help us you know with the additionality principle non physical power where you get the recs now the challenge here is while the uh, vppas are a prominent tool for the developed nations like us europe and other of the countries a lot of corporates global giants and a lot of pharma companies have also tied up for the vppa for their re journey but in india there is a limitation because mainly there are two things which is involved in a vppa contract one is the uh, bilateral trade of rec which the project generates the other is the financial settlement which is like you know contract for difference which is a standard terms in vppa now this contract for difference which is a financial settlement between the spv holding the project and the uh, consumer who is getting the benefit of recs or recs now the issue is that this financial settlement falls under the derivative you know in a definition of derivative and there are limitations in terms of uh, uh, you know uh, prevailing rules on security contract uh, regulation act and that's where this financial settlement becomes an issue uh, we are trying out with couple of uh, you know uh, ipps and the their their investors to look at that you know uh, instead of doing a we will will we, we can can we try out uh, like you know simple rec purchase and we make a capital investments in the spv we become a equity partner in the spv so that our additionality mm -hmm. further gets strengthened the partnership further gets strengthened and the long term commitment can be seen and then the spv which is making a profit or the earning can can the pass on the benefit in terms of uh, interest or dividend to lower the rec cost or mm -hmm. higher cost so that's how uh, we are trying to do this is like you know pure no, this is not a cfd this is a simple rec purchase but at the same time the irec cost has to come down the, the irec price currently you know for such contract are quoting in the range of say 60 70 80 paisa which mm -hmm. adds to a significant cost base for the consumers and can become a deterrent so can this be irec cost be lower down maybe my guess is uh, as low as say 10 paisa 15 paisa for yeah. something like you know by modeling the some of the return through the equity route or the uh, uh, dividend or interest or something so that's what my take is that we are working on some of the model yet to fix on the model and then the other thing is that once the uh, cfd is allowed the regulations like i think there are a couple of task force formed at the different uh, government bodies to look at the cfd options if that comes in the option can have that you know this contract can be converted into the cfd contract mm. that's mm. where uh, we are in the planning stage at the moment 
Oh, that's fascinating. So there is the BPPA, the India way uh, that you are looking at. Uh, that's very interesting and novel uh, route indeed. And uh, you have also touched upon what I want to talk about another sort of a new route, which is ISTS. And I think I'll take this to both Mr. Animesh Sharma and Dheeraj uh, Malani today. Uh, I think uh, we have ISTS waiver, which has come about. I mean, it is not notified yet by CERC, but I'm assuming a lot of players are already assuming the notification will come through because there's a lot of activity in terms of obtaining uh, stage two connectivity uh, by large players for large parcels of land with ISTS in mind. So this work is already in, uh, set in motion. So where are we at? What are the I would like to ask you uh, to elaborate the practical um, uh, practical implementation approach when it comes to ISTS, like starting from the approval side, uh, is it going to be a challenge to the consumer side? As Animesh also said, it may not be for all consumers out there. So uh, while it is hailed as a wonderful uh, incentive and that it has the opportunity to sort of really expand the market size, what are the practical realities behind ISTS and open access? I think I'd like to start with um, Mr. Animesh Sharma and then Mr. Viraj Malani can take it over from there. Okay, thanks. Interesting question. So yes, ISTS definitely has come as a blessing, uh, you know, especially for consumers who are having uh, their factories established in resource deficit states, right? So you don't have good solar or you don't have good wind, what do you do? So you need to procure power so you, you can take advantage of that one nation one that I was talking about. So as an idea, it's, it's supremely good. But uh, again, policy uncertainty. So how well is it implemented on the ground? That is an uncertainty. So developers are going ahead. In fact, we also are going ahead. We are developing a not very big, but 350 megawatt uh, wind solar hybrid connected to the CTU. Uh, okay. what, what's happening is that, that this PGCL has laid out very, very clear ground rules about what the procedure is going to be. Mm. The problem comes is because it's a concurrent subject. So you know if your drawl state you know i mean the consumer is connected at an stu which he's not connected to a ctu or a pgcl substation and you'll find very very few as animesh was rightly mentioning it's probably going to be the large iron and steel or you know cement manufacturers who might be connected to a ctu substation directly but otherwise everyone is connected and dealing through uh stus and uh, state discounts mm -hmm. that's where you know the the plot thickens okay so procedure about the state giving long-term open access right that is a question mark today. so a couple of checks that developers are doing from their end is number one they are they are actually looking at okay which state are we going to route this power to what is the kind of transmission corridor availability right so that's number one check and uh, number two again it is you know going doing a lot of interactions with local transcos and sldcs about you know what's what are their thought processes and I mean, they're sitting quite at the edge. Um, they say, "Hum de bhi denge, hum nahi de sakte hain." Aap apply kar do. I mean, that's the kind of behavior that uh, we are seeing. Uh, so there is an element of risk in the entire ISTS gamut. But I think once the GNA gets notified, right? Once, mm -hmm. once, once everyone has access to the ISTS above 50 megawatt, uh, and uh, even the STU connected customers have access, I think that's when things will start really clearing up. And we will be able to take the true advantage of this, uh, this extremely good policy that the Ministry of Power has got out. And okay. we don't have much time. Uh, I mean, the, the MOP guideline says that all these projects, if you really want to enjoy ISTS charges waiver, is projects need to be commissioned by 2025 June. So okay. there's not a lot of time on the calendar. That is right. But how are states going to react to a lot of in, interstate flow of power? Do you think there will be pushback? I'm assuming. That is quite expected, right? I mean, yeah. I'm telling you, it's the same concept. So they are not conducive to let uh, high paying customers, um, you know, uh, go the open access, green open access route with intrastate itself. So here we are talking yeah. about, you know, getting power from another state into your state. So we will see a lot of pushback. I mean, I'm expecting a lot of pushback, but I mean, mm -hmm. as Animesh was mentioning, I mean, these are the risks that are there in the industry and, you know, you have to play around with them. So. Mm -hmm. The problem is that you know a lot of these deals will still go through the group captive route is what or the captive route is what we're presuming 
and uh, yes. unfortunately as the scheme is there today uh, you you don't immunize yourself from the vagaries of the discom yes the discom mm. once you know the troll state discom can still come and slap some arbitrary charge on you and that's where you know this entire gna gets extremely important because they very clearly define what are the charges that you can charge there's no other arbitrary charge there. Mm-hmm. And from the consumer point of view, you mentioned that uh, this is only going to make sense for uh, uh, CTU and STU. That's what you said, right? In connected consumer. CTU definitely because they, you immune yourself from the state discom, right? I mean, you're directly doing a buy them. Usually, all these guys are having captive power plants in some other state, and they're already doing this, so they have experience. Uh, so I don't see much of a problem for them. Uh, but what kind of consumers does it really make sense? Again, as Animesh was saying. Uh, it might not make sense for people who are connected at you know uh, distribution voltage levels because you start mm. having wheeling being introduced uh, mm. it might not make sense for people who depend on a lot of banking so intermittent load you know where your uh, production is not you know constant mm. might not make sense but it will make sense for power guzzlers who have got high operating base loads right so that's that's something that they can definitely tie up for because then you know you don't you get away with this you know, entire concept of requirement of banking because you have to do real-time power settlement here in 15-minute mm. blocks. Okay. And do you see big opportunity states in, with all these criteria in mind with in terms of large consumers, uh, demand, connectivity, connected to the right uh, CTU or STU? Do you have some states in mind that are likely to jump out as uh, winners for, uh, for the ISDS waiver? A couple of states are good. So Tamil Nadu is one. I think they're slightly conducive uh, uh, in terms of their at least uh, transcos uh, who are open to this idea. Uh, there's a lot of power guzzlers. There's a lot of uh, iron and steel happening in Odisha, mining and minerals mm-hmm. happening in Jharkhand. These all mm-hmm. these are all guzzlers. Uh, mm-hmm. These are states of interest where you will start seeing a lot of, uh, as I said, high base operating load customers, Maharashtra, Gujarat, mm-hmm. Rajasthan. Mm-hmm. Right, and uh, from the standpoint of uh, you know states which are resource deficient, um, so northeast is one. You know you don't have much except for hydro today. So, but again, it's all it all depends on how well we integrate the entire transmission corridors uh, from say the southern grid to the eastern grid or the northeastern grid. Understood. Understood. That's interesting. So uh, that just sort of brings me also to uh, Hiraj. I would like to understand. So this is now suddenly become. Uh, a big player's game uh, you know you'll have to sort of invest in land and uh, connectivity in large pockets across various uh, you know interesting states like Rajasthan and Karnataka so uh, where do you come in as a DPC player what role can you play to sort of enable uh, the ecosystem for open access especially in the interstate context thank you uh, Sangeeta and good afternoon to all. Uh, so as you mentioned that EPC player, how they can act as an enabler for the entire ecosystem. And I think that's the role which uh, me in Oriano is playing and personally also from last 10 to years, I'm serving this industry in the same uh, same way. Whether it was utility, so I was earlier touched upon with the utility segment as well as and now in CNDI as well. <laughs> we have seen a churning happening day by day and as animesh mentioned that there are lot many challenges with the ists uh, thing coming into picture and working out but at the end of the day we all have to make the things works in what what way that we have to see so what i see here that a consumer has also first to make their requirement clear and they they have to make their energy security philosophy work in a way they have to work both short term and medium term it is not like that you have signed a power purchase agreement and that will make you last for another 10 12 years or 15 years or so in short term also you have also to remain that your energy security for your organization remains intact so for that i i am watching that exchanges are playing a very good role not only GTAM and GDAM, even there is a product which is called as real-time market, where you can go and purchase the power for the very next hour. It may be brown, it may be green, depending on the situation, but access to power is available. Once you are a grid-connected 
consumer and uh, you have all those flexibility within the framework of your load which you have mentioned to procure the power i think now you have lot many routes available with you so if a consumer properly strategize his base load from a medium term point of view and the spikes which they are getting as animesh janji has mentioned that there are spikes in their consumption so those spikes if they men, if they uh, go through power exchanges or maybe through traders in a way that they secure that particular power in in the very next hour or maybe very next day uh, then i think that combination is a workable solution now coming to the ists point of view of the ctu which we are talking about now being an epc player we are always cost possessive okay aur kahin par bhi agar do paise bachte hain to wo karne ka so in ctu i i believe it's a big cost economics which will make sense for both uh, cndi medium and large consumer as well as that developer because in india also if you will see geographically we are so divided seasonality variations are there festival variations are there so depending on these things your demand is changing as well as your generation profile is also varying based on how uh, sun radiations are available across the country now if something is a uh, a cost is a cheaper affair in maybe one state and there is a barren land available there is a big infrastructure available big evacuation system available and there is a second state where all these things are less available but since the consumer is lo located in the second state under present scenario he has to build his captive power plant or maybe third party open access within that state which is not right from in from a natural point of view also matlab we are not actually utilizing the this this natural resource of sun to the rightful extent if we are putting up let's suppose power plant in a state where land is very costly where land is less available where radiations are weak but factories are located there because of some another economic reasons so i believe ists is something which will play a critical role in optimizing the cost of the power plant and definitely it will go back to the final consumer only matlab in a way developer will get benefit similarly the consumer will get benefit and similarly his final output of the product which he is selling will get the benefit so, so this benefit will reach right from the first point of developer till the last point of the human like mm -hmm. us in 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 terms of the consumer of those products not directly the electricity but also the consumer of those products so that is my way of looking at it and i i i wish that uh, this thing both developers and consumers will understand that how to contractually make these things conducive so that the risk will get mitigated for both developer as well as consumer in a way that power plant on this merchant style or this uh, ists network will come up as animesh mentioned that there are risks associated so maybe developers will have little apprehension over it so i'll ask consumers to play a role here that they make the ecosystem conducive for developers to take a brave decision to put the power plants on the merchant capacities and then mm -hmm. as this open access regime goes rational then that entire benefit will pass so okay. that's okay. my take on this particular subject okay that's interesting indeed and that's a, a sort of a sort of a changing role of an epc service provider so to speak from being just traditionally setting up a uh, power plant to sort of setting up an entire ecosystem is what you are talking about and that's very interesting Thiraj. um we have touched upon a little bit about the new uh, procurement routes like through bppas or isds uh, i would like to sort of now move on a little bit to uh, uh, forward looking technologies and uh, that's where i want to speak to you sai so thank you for waiting patiently uh, we wanted to touch upon the all important very interesting issue of storage and it sort of really captured a lot of people's imaginations especially in the last couple of weeks with these tenders coming out 
in Kerala, which Hero won, and then uh, there was the other Seki tender that with JSW won. And if you look at the numbers of uh, at which they have won, it, it, if uh, a very simple math, if we do, it breaks down to roughly nine to ten rupees per unit. That is the cost of power that is being sold. Um, now that in the context of the numbers we are seeing for solar and wind, it seems astronomical. So uh, we do know that you, uh, as part of Jinko, also have a product in the storage market. Uh, you are working with uh, consumers, CNI consumers across the world. Would like to hear your thoughts on storage market. When, when do you think it's really going to make sense in India? And what are the technologies that are likely to uh, get picked up when it does? So over to you, Sam. Hi, Sangeeta. Hello, everyone. So yeah. Uh... Specific to this particular storage market or any kind of C and I consumers more specifically. So converting to 100% kind of RE definitely it, it depends on two different aspects because the plain vanilla kind of plain solar or plain wind or a hybrid combination solar plus wind is not going to suffice the requirement of 100%. But yes, there are certain techniques within solar itself if they try to go for high power density and high energy density. The kind of technology mm. optimization definitely can leverage the benefit in reducing the levelized cost of energy. This is one part of the game. And on the other side, just to get the 100% power availability specific to time of the applications for, for C and A kind of customers to typical states uh, consumers with uh, to a typical state consumers like Karnataka. And definitely they have to go with these kind of options like storage plus solar with uh, these kind of optimized solutions. Which generally mm. can be with n type popcorn kind of technology and within storage if we just try to see as per the recent tenders where we could see that uh, this nine rupees or ten rupees per kilo whatever which is what is being popped out and what we could see is that these kind of storage technologies it's not just limiting only to nmh or lfp mm. or lithium titanium or any other uh, uh, pumped pumped storage kind of solutions but if we just try to look these particular aspects very keenly as on date, the existing technology, which is what is there, which is completely capturing majority of the market, which is there up to 100 kilowatt hours kind of requirement for CNI customers is being dominated by advanced lead acid batteries, which is the fact. But if you're trying to move beyond this particular 100 kilowatt hours kind of storage capability, if you want to move towards one megawatt hour or two megawatt hours or beyond that, definitely one has to look for these kind of LFP kind of solutions. Because mm -hmm. NMH nickel metal hydride kind of solutions is best suited for automobile kind of applications. If there is any kind of motility which is happening, yes, definitely that makes more sense with the depth of discharge of up to 60%, 70% with NMH can be possible. But whereas if we just try to look at the typical applications for a CNI market where in which the constant load is possible uh, for, for textile industries kind of thing, if at all, if we try to look for uh, Sipla kind of zones where in which uh, Sipla kind of industry where in which the uh, peak load is going to be intermittent and the base load is going to be constant for these kind of segments if we just try to see definitely we have to go with a kind of least possible charge discharge profile battery technology and for that mm. LFP is, is one such kind of technology where in which we have provided these kind of solutions within a containerized kind of solutions starting mm. with uh, uh, two megawatt as a kind of continuous power output with mm. 5.4 megawatt hour kind of solutions as a kind of con complete containerized solution which is BSS BSS solution which comes with uh, BMS anyway the battery yeah. management system along with the battery part with LFP kind of configuration configuration apart from that anyway EMS and uh, the PCS which is completely going to be a kind of comprehensive solution which is going to be a kind of plug and play kind of mechanism so that way these solutions are available but yeah. looking at the cost prospects as on date we easily could see that as per the minerals uh, website data or the uh, trajectory of these particular prices as on date this particular solution is just standing at 300 kilowatt hours uh, three sorry uh, 300 dollars per kilowatt hour to 330 dollars per kilowatt hour which is huge and mm -hmm. this 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 particular trajectory has to fall at around like 180 to 220 so which mm -hmm. is what is expected and this should fall down within a span of uh, 8 to 12 quarters kind of timeline and if you just try to look at the trajectory of these particular lithium uh, lithium ion or the lithium mines the kind of investment which is what is going to happen on this particular segment 
is mm. is going to be close to around like 42 billion dollar investment by the end of 2030 Mm-hmm. and as on date if we just try to see only 6 6 lakh million tons of lithium extraction is happening specific to this particular segment and mm-hmm. we we are way forward to see this particular value up to 2.4 million tons of you know uh, lithium ion extraction has to happen which means starting from now on yearly basis 6 to 7 uh, million dollar of investment has to happen Uh, mm-hmm. sorry 6 to 7 billion dollar of investment has to happen just to ha- just to meet these particular uh, demand guidelines or demand demand capacity specific to storage applications if at all if we have a kind of target of meeting 100% re on the cndi kind of segment or on any of the segment so definitely this this kind of trajectories are there where which the investments has to meet that particular uh, capacities so that way we could mm-hmm. see that within a span of 8 to 12 quarter kind of timeline this particular value whatever is there which is standing now at 300 to 330 dollar per kilowatt hour this should fall down at least to 250 or 230 uh, dollar per kilowatt hour which is what we mm-hmm. could see and mm-hmm. as a jinko we are not just only a pv solution provider even we we have extended our uh, capabilities in providing the solution specific to these kind of uh, storage kind of solutions as a kind of 100% re for the ancillary services and starting from 1 kilowatt hour which is what is there with the residential energy storage market and we provided a kind of solution which is what we provided for japanese market where that's a kind of uh, a good solution where which everyone is is trying to uh, consider those kind of solutions for for just having a kind of 100% uh, compatible enough only on re power which which is which is mm-hmm. completely on solar power or any kind of other applications so that mm-hmm. way we could see ress is one segment which is untapped mm-hmm. in indian market and which is completely mm-hmm. dominated by existing advanced lead acid battery but slowly and gradually we should see that that is also going to be captured with these kind of lfp solutions and cndi market anyway is in the mode of whether to go or not to go kind of segment specific to storage applications just because of this particular cost matter probably down That's the line right. definitely they have turned towards this which is what we we expect interesting so uh, i just want to understand is there any interest at all in the indian market and uh, even if it's a little bit would you like to throw some light on uh, sort of what are people looking for and i i understand that the volumes might be very low in the indian market right now but what i'm keen to understand is what's the end use cases for most of the consumers um you can talk about the indian market and also give us some context about the global market what are the end use cases uh, for cni yeah. consumers yes cndi for cndi consumers specifically we could see that standalone uh, uh, application specific to these kind of storage part before the meter which is which is what is happening more in number mm. when compared with any any kind of uh, you know uh, ac coupling kind of systems this is more happening with the dc coupled kind of systems which has happened as a kind of standalone systems for a kind of off grid application but yes they have the interconnection with the grid but mm-hmm. the kind of storage capability whatever they are trying to provide is is a, is a kind of off grid application for them as and when it is required they are just trying to sort take support of that but yes in the matured markets specific to australian market and specific to north american market what we noticed is that even for the european market also even for the grid interactive applications also these kind of uh, grid storage applications or or the kind of grid support on the fronts of uh, not just limiting only to ancillary services but even on the arbitrage as well we could see that the kind of support is there uh, as a kind of trading mechanism so slowly and eventually what animesh sharma has shown within his presentation specific to the arbitrage services also going forward within the iex itself even the distributed generation markets or the power houses storage houses which has to be created in kilowatt hour kind of segment can really curtail down these existing transmission line losses and can really reduce the congestion which is what is there on the transmission segment transmission mm-hmm. sector so mm-hmm. this is what we expect and specific to indian market it's still in nascent stage the kind of uh, response what we see uh, when compared with the pv applications like for the mm-hmm. topcon kind of technology n type technology so we we, mm-hmm. we hear out very very uh, very now and then from from our clients and they consume that particular product specific to pv applications but when it yeah. comes for these kind of storage application it's a kind of wait and watch just because of these particular uh, topped up numbers and probably when the moment when this comes down definitely we could see certain cndi clients are very much willing to test the waters with these kind of lfp solutions in a containerized kind of thing 
so probably mm-hmm. that's that's what even we we were also uh, an- anxiously looking out for interesting animesh mr animesh jain you are exploring if i'm not wrong right something in goa i i remember from one of your previous presentations that uh, you're exploring a solar plus storage system right now do you want to sort of talk to us about it a little so i think you know uh, as explained by sai very clearly i think the lithium ion batteries prices and other things have gone significantly high and probably not making a viable economically viable so you know any technology or any solution i think either if you look at in solar or solar or wind sector also it starts with a government driven or a policy driven and when it reaches to a economics of larger adoption uh, economy which this is which you know it can be adopted large at a large scale by the and then it becomes a market driven or demand driven so what i see that in a storage also mm-hmm. it's going to take the same path it is starts with the government driven like you know you see the take uh, tenders or other tenders so it starts with the government driven or policy driven and with the cost economics coming to a play at a uh, with the with the you know lithium ion battery prices or the battery technology prices coming down it will become a market driven so the other thing which i see the trend i if i have to say and that's what we are contemplating is you know uh, like you know if you look at the recent uh, renewable uh, uh, purchase obligations the uh, the mop has come up with the energy storage obligations maybe a smaller percentage for the discounts mm-hmm. and now the discounts also have to start now uh, saying you know certain percentage of power and this is all done and the to see that you know we have a grid stability with the, you know with the rise of solar or wind power the infirm nature of power the new capacities are not uh, to be co- will not be coming in a thermal to to balance the infirm nature of the the sources there is a need for storage what so again what i contem- further i can you know what i can uh, think sense of is some of the state discoms will start looking at putting this condition for the cni open access so they may say that the cni open access is allowed or is you know they can say that is mandated to put certain capacity of battery storage solution along with the open access capacity and that is what uh, i am sensing that it should it can happen and in the goa particularly i think the goa uh, the the consumption pattern the evening peak of 6 to 11 they they have significant high purchase cost while on the day time they are able to procure the power at a at a at a market competitive rate but the evening peak and where the consumptions are significant in proportion to the total consumption uh, the load of you know uh, consumption of goa so that way i see that they have a issues with the peak demand or peak consumption mm-hmm. and probably a battery storage solution can help you to offset a certain uh, you know load or certain pressure on the uh, discounts and they may start looking at it uh, that you know open access is allowed with battery why i am sensing so because if you look at the current solar goa solar open access policy which was 2017 which was you know expired in 2022 the last version it says that the open access is allowed in a evening peak zone 6 to 11 pm so that is what the current policy of goa is so if it has to open up larger so they will continue to hold the 6 to 11 pm as a mandate and they will broaden the day time so the somebody has to come up and wind is not a solution like you know offshore wind could be a potential but onshore winds are not possible in goa so the solar plus battery i see something happening in the some of the states interesting thank you and anish and uh, viraj have you in your experience also seen such uh, demand even whatever small volumes might be from consumers and any interesting use end use cases we'd love to hear from so on storage i have a uh, perspective which i want to put here uh, so uh, in 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 our normal conventional uh, re concept like ists we were talking about so there is a tariff at generator bus bar and then there are sort of transmission charges losses cross subsidy additional surcharge and whatever not huh? all sort of pancaking is happening till the time it reaches to the final consumer so just make a comparison between transferring the electricity in this particular conventional route versus if we 
adopt a physical route and transferring the storage system access to the consumer so will that make a better sense or uh, using this particular entire network and other systems uh, will will make a better sense? i i'm just giving a perspective so that people will start thinking in that particular uh, uh, way because i remember sometimes some years back when when we established lot many gas based power plants in india and then we get to know that there is a gas scarcity available and those assets become standard to the tune of somewhere i think 20000 23000 megawatt right mm. uh, my numbers may be little bit here and there it can be corrected so such large capacity becomes standard on gas because of non availability of gas at that time also people have thought of this particular solution that can we import the gas or lng from outside and transform it into electricity using these gas based power plants and then giving it to the final consumer in in the form of the storage system available right in front of his factory door so that mm -hmm. thing i believe now is the time when uh, we have these uh, storage systems available in 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 multiple capacities like from some kilowatts to megawatts we have a big variety available in this storage systems and i heard many cases now in the market that replacement of dgs are uh, something which is going on through these storage systems and which is again making a viable solutions even in these costly affairs so as sai has mentioned that next 8 to 10 quarters we will see a sharp decrease in these uh, uh, particular prices of the storage system so that will make i think the case more uh, economically viable that's my perspective right um i think um, animesh do you have anything to add to that mr animesh sir yeah just so i've got one anecdotal point right so uh, i think uh, sai has very eloquently mentioned that today probably it's making sense on the large scale you know storage is probably going to make sense initially in the large scale bit before you know it trickles down to you know maybe a 500 kilowatt hour or a 300 kilowatt hour typical requirement so one consumers need to be extremely extremely uh, aware about what do they need to use a storage for you know there are various use cases for storage so we were doing it for one of our parent company for our parent company and uh, for their factory in andhra and uh, a brilliant use case you know they've got around uh, including sunday some 52 holidays in a year where production doesn't happen but uh, solar is still getting generated it's more than a megawatt ka plant so there is no net metering and i mean that's a waste of energy right there's a waste of capital that you put in there so they were they were quite aggressive and keen on you know exploring an on-site you know storage lithium ion storage mm -hmm. uh, we did the entire <clears throat> design and you know kind of capacity assessment etc but you know, cost today are prohibitively high i mean i mean no cni uh, unless and until you know they are just doing it uh, you know for some um, their consumer side mandate that you know, you have to install so many kilowatt hours of energy storage probably that's an idea whose time has not come today in terms of small scale storage right so you cannot go and try making a business case out of selling someone a 200 kilowatt hour system or a 500 kilowatt hour system Have to run it into megawatt hours to start seeing some economy of scale. Mm -hmm. So Sai was also putting up that probably you know you are seeing uh, introduction of lithium ion phosphate batteries and technologies coming into picture, and change in battery chemistry happening. Uh, probably uh, as Animesh has also quite rightly put, there will be uh, you know demand side mandate from the government on discom. that's where you know demand will start spiking up and it's a mixture of all these things which will get that battery cost into that sweet spot so today the entire industry is waiting for that sweet spot for battery storage and i think the day that comes then i mean you know storage actually immunizes you so so many problems that you know we are facing today in the market right so mm -hmm. especially banking because renewables by their nature is informed okay yeah. so So when this happens, so I think that's the tipping point that we are waiting for. So really, really eagerly waiting for the battery prices to correct and you know some new cost-effective chemistries in commercial viability. Absolutely. I think I'll just bring it back to what is actually happening right now. I would like a quick input about what do you think it means uh, for the existing open access market in light of the new open access, uh, green open access rules. 
uh, there it looks very interesting on paper uh, you know it has re reduced the threshold for accessibility to open access to 100 kilowatt um, it uh, it allows it asks for minimum banking for at least a month for up to 30 percent of the total consumption from discom um, it's asking for waivers of additional surcharge for green open access um, for green uh, uh, consumers who are availing of uh, renewable energy so all this is excellent on paper and it looks like it, it really can sort of expand the market by say 10 times and even right now the market is not doing too badly our numbers that have just come and show that in the first half of for this year alone india has added about 1.7 gigawatt of solar power solar open access power so that's a lot of open access capacity addition that's happening so at, the, at this rate at the end of the year you're easily looking at a two and a half gigawatt capacity addition uh, so even in the current st status open access is looking very attractive there are many reasons for this i'm sure because there is a fear of almm coming in and so i can chip in to, like, to see how almm being imposed on open access can really impact impact the market pcd has already uh, led to quite a bit of a short supply uh, prices have shot up domestic modules prices have shot up modules are in short supply so we have a lot of policy issues as well but on the bright side that there is this green open access rules that have come up states are yet to notify them karnataka has come up with a tentative like a draft regulation which is a very interesting sign and they've adopted most of the rules so in light of this what is the outlook for the open access market the interest interstate open access market is it really going to uh, uh, really going to increase substantially in terms of market size or uh, do you think there will be substantial hurdles to overcome um, like anyone on the panel to sort of answer this please we can start please. with the developers animation or, or yes sorry, yes please go ahead yes. yeah so specific to almm since you pointed out about almm so the major challenge whatever is there with almm is that uh, it's, it's it's a kind of process verification uh rather than product verification so we have certain standards within india as bas if it can just strengthen those particular guidelines specific to product certification along with that product particular product certification within the factory level certification also if we can complete that particular process probably there is no need of alm but since we have alm as a kind of separate uh in the ingredient kind of aspect for just evaluating these particular manufacturers for or for the kind of material whatever is coming into india and then how how exactly the, the product is being manufactured it's, it's it's more specific to the standard how exactly they are trying to follow in and on the fronts of almm if you just try to see almost the top tier manufacturers already has applied for almm but still yeah. uh, so just because of the travel restrictions due to covid so the the process uh, of almm certification for international manufacturers is not yet completed and even mnr is also uh, quite watchful on that and trying to complete that particular activity uh, and we are hopeful for that but looking at the present scenario for cndi market for the net metering projects and open access projects there has been a kind of extension which has happened specific to almm and as for the recent uh, delegation whatever we had with mnre and okay. also the kind of high level discussion whatever we had we are even highly hopeful that there is one more round of extension which is what is going to happen oh, just because that's... the reason yes the reason again is that looking at the current capacities of indian market the mm -hmm. demand versus the existing manufacturing capacities and the export component whichever is happening from the local domestic manufacturers is not in a position yeah. to meet the existing demand so mm -hmm. that way we have to go with one more round of extension extension is going to happen but that's going to happen for one quarter or two quarters that's mm -hmm. that that's quite uh, a wait and watch kind of thing but yes we are we are highly hopeful and expected that this extension is going to happen interesting so specifically this, this will help this will help cni market absolutely um that must be music to your ears animation unless of course uh, you already know it, Mr. Animesh. <laughs> Clearly, you are in the know. So that's a good thing. However, this kind of an approach is a little difficult for developers or consumers to plan. You can't wait on extensions in the last minute. Um, so, how are you uh, looking at the market, especially with the, it opening up some more with respect to the open access rules? Okay. So, twofold answer from my side. So, first, uh, yes, green uh, open access regulations are most welcome. Uh, but again, uh, congruent subject. So uh, 
on current subjects. So states have to notify and accept. Karnataka is probably taking a lead. Let's see how other states follow suit. But if they do, then yes, I mean it just opens up uh, you know the market really wide. I mean right now the you know capacity curtailment, uh, the minimum capacity requirement. You know they were kind of yeah. short sizing. The real penetration will happen then in the SMEs level also, right? Who've got typical connected loads of you know, maybe 200 kilowatt, 400 kilowatt, and today they are restricted to only procure their energy from their respective discounts. So, yes, as a market, it's going to explode. Okay, now when does it explode? It might happen state by state by state by state, as and when they notify this policy. The okay. second part of my answer is uh, yes, uh, it looks promising to go towards you know, from 1.8 gigawatts to two and a half gigawatts. But again, uh, having been in the market, having uh, lots of discussions with uh, possible off-takers, uh, the threat of BCD, um, threat of timely module availability, the threat of, uh, you know, price escalations in terms of modules. I mean, it's extremely volatile, this module market. You know, it's been so for the better part of the probably last eight, 10 months. So coming to a commercial viable tariff right now, because you know what happens in the consumer's mind, Animesh might accept this is once a benchmark is set, once you've mm -hmm. once you've gone ahead and signed the PPA and say three rupees forty paisa X bus, it's very difficult for the consumer also to you know kind of digest this fact that suddenly the tariffs are going upwards of four. Mm -hmm. So they might want to play a wait and watch game because all these contracts are long gestation contracts, right? So unless and until some innovative tariff modeling comes into picture where you've got some structured tariff over a period of time, there is some sort of a um, relief for the developer in case the module price spikes by the time you kind of install it. So again, there's a lot of variables in this equation. And I mean, honestly, I don't see all these variables falling into place together. Mm. It's a read and watch game. Let's see which side the camel wakes up. Uh, short run, I, I, I mean, there are reports which are which were pegging 3.8 gigawatts of total capacity addition this fiscal year, but I doubt that's going to touch base. Uh, 3.8 gigawatts of uh, CNI. CNI open access, yeah. Open access, okay. Well, like I said, I we are at one. Point, no, we are at about 1.7, 1.8 today, as of June 30th. That is the number that we have uh, at Bridge to India, and. Um, you are going to, and if the, if the restrictions, uh, if as per size said, if there is a bit of a one or two quarter increase uh, in uh, the LMM before the LMM comes on uh, to these consumers as well, I think there is a good chance that similar capacity can be added in the next two quarters as well. However, you are also right. Uh, module prices are super volatile right now. Lots of stockpiling has happened in the last uh, first. Uh, you know, quarter and the quarter Q4 2021 that will run dry. So we'll have to see where uh, the modules will come in, even though there might be an appetite for deploy deployment for CNI open access. So um, I, I, I have last questions to each one of you to sort of wrap this up. We have only a couple of minutes. So I just want to ask each one of you that how, what is the approach as a, a consumer or as a service provider to this industry the scope of work has clearly changed from my uh, sort of discussions with you in the last one hour uh, for example animesh you had given us you 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 are approaching uh, this segment not just as a power provider but you're looking at providing holistic services so if the market there is a good appetite in the market for that so i'd love to hear a little bit more about how this evolution is going to go forward and similarly with animation Jen as well. As a consumer, you are looking at how are you looking at RE100 at an aggregate company level because you are also looking at spending money. You're not looking purely from cost savings, for example, when you're spending IREX, buying IREX. So if you can talk to us a little about how the scope of your uh, fundamental business has changed a little in light of uh, the changing paradigms of the industry. Which animation goes first? I'll leave that to you. Okay, I'll take it. So, uh, Sangeeta, it's a very interesting question. Uh, how we are approaching this entire solution provider um, role that we are donning now is, uh, it's, it, you know, it's a, it's a very consultative approach. I mean, we need to sit across the table with our customers, understand their, you know, requirements today, understand how are they fulfilling, their, fulfilling those requirements today. And as I said, you know, it 
spans across. It spans from energy efficiency to energy improvement measures to energy procurement to maximizing whatever you can do on your site. So it's a very consultative approach that we've taken. Uh, we are already servicing two clients uh, in this manner where everything starts right from, you know, okay, you have a factory in Assam. Uh, what can we do with that factory in Assam? So we, we look at conveyor belts, we look at rooftops, any possible place. So extract the maximum out of that site, okay? Uh, deploy, as I was saying, we've got an in-house IoT platform-based, you know, energy monitoring uh, tool, which you know, we deploy there to understand their uh, usage of energy, you know, that really helps you because, again, renewables is in for. So the more you understand the consumption pattern, the better you can size your plants. So that's the way we are approaching this. And we've got very positive feedback from our clients also. I mean, they, they like, you know, I mean, it's, it's one entity that they're dealing with who's helping them from, you know, you can actually call it from the well to the wall. Mm -hmm. so I, that is, that, I think the industry needs, that was the gap that probably we're trying to fill and I'm sure uh, the industry will be happy also to kind of get solutions from a single solution. Thank you. And, um, absolutely, absolutely. And I think I would like to hear from Mr. Jain right now. Yeah. So, uh, Sangeeta, I think, you know, as I was explaining the RE journey, so you will start with the, uh, Say physical power delivery in initial say re40 re30 stage when you want to reach it and that's where you start saving the money so maybe you know whenever you know like you know in, for us if you say we have we have saved money in karnataka and maharashtra in an initial path of our R journey what you do is that in an initial path of journey when you save money you will be able to as the curve gets a split a step then you will have to start deploying some of the this money which you have saved in the physical power mm -hmm. delivery or you will have to deploy it for the larger for the later part of RE journey and then you have to look at the overall uh, you know are you able to make it yet as a cost neutral or cost positive your RE uh, sustainability as a whole if you start looking at that you know every other solution is going to be a cost saving or cost neutral it may not be mm -hmm. there could be some of the states some of the places where the you know the the state discount prices are high and there is a open access is available you are able to arbitrage and get, save money there are places where you will have to deploy those saved money mm -hmm. to make this uh, EBITDA neutral See, ultimately the companies are focusing on EBITDA so your current cost basis are there which you don't want to increase significantly because of the sustainability at a larger at a larger goal level so this can become a EBITDA neutral mm -hmm if you start uh, deploying the portfolio approach if you become too fanatic about the saving every penny at every solution it may not work understood understood that, that that's an interesting so at an aggregate level that's your approach as a consumer uh thank you animesh uh, sharma and animation for that uh, like like quick summary of how you are approaching it um uh, dheeraj and sai i would like to just ask you one last question again one wish list for the CNI sector. What is the one thing that would really be a game changer in the next 12 months for the sector to really attain its potential? If there's just one quick answer from each one of you uh, before we wrap up for the day, that'll be great. I think the answer to this question is existing in your previous question itself. The RE rules which are there, if they are implemented smoothly, I think it will become a a very green picture for the CNDI segment and things would become automatically viable. But if they are considered as one of the regulation, which we have seen from 2003 till now, not many regulations have come in such a way and they have short lived. So the important thing here is the thing, the short, well, instead of these regulations or these rules to be short lived, we have to make it to, to run for a longer journey so that things would become conducive and then probably it will benefit to the CNDI segment and to the developers both. Otherwise, it will be considered as one of the small relief to the things mm. and then it will it will go away. Now, we have seen in Karnataka and other places that regulations have come up, lot many reliefs have come up, lot many incentives have been given, lot many promotions have happened, but then it will be taken away after maybe five years or something. So that window need to be little bit strengthened to a bigger extent. Hmm. Okay, thank you. And Sai, I feel like I know your answer, but yeah. Yeah, it's, it's more like just adding to uh, 
Deeraj, Animes Jain, and Animes Sharma. It's more uh, of like specific to us as an OEM. What we always will be looking at is it's a mix of demand plus policy plus technology. As a technology mm -hmm. provider, we are upgrading our technology. Uh, and if you have immediate requirements, definitely uh, it's, it's going to be expensive. But yes, looking at the tenders, whatever are coming in, uh, which are floating in as per the uh, upcoming GVNL or SECI or NTPC, we could see that the traction is going to happen for the next eight quarter uh, for the for the next after the after eight months or 12 months kind of timeline which is close mm -hmm. to a kind of three to four quarter kind of timeline so by that time mm -hmm. we could see that sudden uh, there, there can be a kind of uh, decline in the existing prices and yes mm -hmm. uh, the solutions are ready which are high-end mm -hmm. technologies which can which can lead to the, the best possible least possible levelized cost of energy kind of solutions probably this is what we uh, we are we are we are trying to offer to the market and we would like to support to all kinds of c and customer base on this fantastic thank you so much Sai. and i think i'd like to wind up on that note it was a wonderful discussion everyone and it was really a pleasure to have here from everyone uh, so i will now hand it over uh, to my colleague neha makul to close this event over to you neha thank you sangeeta thank you panelists for an extremely interesting session and sharing your insights. I would like to thank uh, our partners, Hero Future Energy, for sponsoring and supporting today's session. Finally, I would like to thank the audience for uh, being a part of this webinar, and we will be sharing the recording of today's session and sending it to your registered email account, and will be also uploaded on our website. Um, our next webinar is planned in the month of September, and it will be on the role of digital, uh, digitalization uh, in renewable energy and uh, we plan to meet you again then until then it is goodbye from all of us thank you so much thank you thank you